Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays at 9 a.m. We also gather together in a building, which the church is in, and we'd love to have you come by one of these days, especially during the summer. Bring your kids with you and just sit down, and we'll have a quick Devo before you start your day. We are at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. And so we are going to begin in chapter 2 of the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. Let's go ahead and pray and then we'll get into the word. Gracious Father, we, we come before you this morning and we thank you, Lord, for another day. We ask that you minister to us through your word. And as we briefly peruse through this chapter, Father, and just touch on here and there, Lord, I pray that it would be exactly where you want us to be, Lord that we would hear your spirit, Lord. You know what's going on in each one of our lives. You know the struggles, you know the, the hurts and the pain, Lord. And we just want to give that to you, Father, and help us, Lord, to be more like Christ. And so, Father, I guess the challenge today would be be like Christ, which is so difficult for us to do, Lord. Help us, Lord, to surrender through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's open up our Bibles. If you have a highlighter or pencil, you might want to bring them out with your cup of coffee. Let's get started. So we're in chapter 2 of Philippians, and in order to understand the context, we have to go back to chapter 1, because chapter 2 starts with that, therefore, or moreover. And so you have to go back to the fall of the, the previous words to see what he was talking about. So let's just go to verse 29 where Paul says, for, you, for to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. So suffering's coming, but God has been gracious uh, to give you understanding of the gospel and salvation through Jesus Christ. Now having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. In other words, Paul struggled in the past. They heard about that. They read about it. But he's still struggling, and they actually are seeing it in him. Therefore, chapter 2, if there is any consolation or encouragement or comfort or peace, that's what the word means, in Christ, which there is, <laughs> there's a whole study you could do on that alone. Amen. There is in Christ. It's only in Christ Jesus that we, we have our peace, not in this world. <clears throat> If any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affliction and mercy, affections and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Now he puts it that way because we do look up for our own interests. So in these four verses here, we, we see this idea about taking our mind off of the struggles that we go through. And the way that we do that is by serving others. That's the only way you can do it. Just get busy with the Lord. Uh, God wants us to be one-minded. He wants the church to be one-minded. Unfortunately, we're not one-minded. And the reason that we're not one-minded is because we're not applying the scriptures. Someone asked the question, I think it was Jennifer at our discipleship class, uh, can you read the Bible and get different interpretations? And I quickly said, no, you can't. But we do, don't we? We see people out there with different interpretations. So, for instance, if you were to talk to a Mormon, they would look at the whole Bible and they'd say, Jesus is an angel. I'm sorry, he's a God. Jehovah's Witnesses would say he's an angel. So you have two different interpretations. But if you were to read the Bible just for what it is, without reading anyone else's work, you'll find out that Jesus is God, very clearly, if you read it. Um, so I believe that if we truly just surrender ourselves completely to just Scripture, not to what man is saying to us, not to what books we've read before, we will come up with the same truth. I, I think it's clear. And, and one of the truths that... Uh, are in the scriptures is that we need to surrender our lives to Christ. And when we all surrender our lives to Christ, there's a unity that happens in the body of Christ. <clears throat> we all become one in purpose. Now, 
I get the idea of unification of other churches and ministries that are out there. Like I go to, go to a cops and clergy ministry <clears throat> and you have different denominations there, uh, different non-denominations. Uh, you also have, uh, and I'm gonna just say what they're considered in the Christian community, cults like Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons. They're there and they're participating in the cops and clergy. Now, what I've heard in that session from time to time is uh, though we have differences, we are all coming on the same ground and being unified and being servants to the community. So that's the common ground that they're working with so they can work together, you know. And I understand that. I understand that. Now, you won't catch me saying uh, that because we should be working towards preaching the gospel message. And I make that very clear whenever I have that opportunity. So there's a, there's a unification uh, that is there that the world puts on us, but that's not what Christ is talking about. We don't find common ground. The common ground is Christ himself and the scriptures. That's how we become unified in Christ. And so we need to read the scriptures and we need to be in unity of the scriptures. But this is a way from getting out of yourself is by having more interest in others than you do in yourself already and helping. Now, though that's tiring and it's very difficult and tedious at times, but it does help while you're while you're doing that work, while you're serving, while you're participating. I notice that when I'm not, that's when I start thinking, that's when I start going through things because I'm in idle time. So it's a good way to find peace and encouragement through helping others. Let's look at verse five through eight. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now the form of God, meaning that in, in every essence, in every physical appearance, he is God himself in the flesh. That's what the Greek word means there for form of God. Then he goes on, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant and coming in the likeness of man. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So we have this example that Paul gives us of Christ. And ultimately, he is our example. Uh, we, we can use each other as examples of times where we do sacrifice ourselves, but is that continual? No, not all the time. There are times when we don't sacrifice ourselves, when we are tired and we don't want to do it, or we uh, are in a situation that keeps us from doing those things. But Christ is the perfect example to use. If you ever, ever get an opportunity while talking with someone and they ask you questions, well, what about this and what about that? What about that person, this person and that person? What about the Crusades? What about that leader? And this? Look, we go back to Christ. Let's just look at Christ because he's the one. He's the one that we should be looking at. Men will fail us at one point. And this is why you can't lift men up. We need to keep them on the ground, just like we are. We're all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. But you can lift Christ up. He's perfect. And he gave us the example from day one all the way to the crucifixion. He was that perfect example of a servant. And I don't know of any time that... Um, I'm just trying to think in my head, where Jesus actually had someone do something for him. Though there was the woman who brought her alabaster oil and poured it on his feet, but that was fulfill scripture and anoint him for his burial. Uh, it wasn't something that uh, he asked for. He oftentimes just gave, right? He always gave, Amen. gave, gave. And that truly is a caregiver. <laughs> One that, that doesn't get burned out also. He doesn't get burned out because he knows who he is. Uh, he understands his call and his work. Now we get burned out because we give, we give, we give, to, and then there's a point where we need something and we don't get it, and all of a sudden it's just like, I give so much and I can't get this. It doesn't make any sense. Um, but we need to grow beyond that, that it's not about what we get. And that's a difficult thing to do. So something to consider, the, the application would be is just serve others. Think of them before you think of yourself, their interests. Then he goes on in verse 9 through 11. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him, that is Jesus, and gave him, Jesus, the name which is above every name. Now, he deserves that. 
There are people in our society that we know from the past because they've been given a name by the world. And so they're famous people. But Jesus' name is probably the most popular name in all of the earth. I don't know if there's anyone that doesn't know that name. I'm sure there's a few. But the point is, is that this name came from God himself. And this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him, he said to the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration. So his name is above every name. And that's important. We can't put our name above his name. His name is above our name also. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Isn't that amazing? That everyone will acknowledge Jesus Christ. There will not be one soul who has been born that will not acknowledge Jesus Christ. Whether you're going to heaven or not, you will see Jesus, you will stand before him, and you would acknowledge him as the name above all other names. So everyone will see their judge. Now Jesus will then say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the kingdom Amen. of God, or he will say, depart from me, I never knew you, you're a worker of iniquity, and he will then sentence you to eternal damnation. And that's his prerogative as the judge. Then he goes on. He says, therefore, and he, and he uses a lot of therefores here, doesn't he? So in light of, in light of this, in light of that, in light of that. So in light of this, the name above all names, every knee will bow before Jesus. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but how much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Now this is an interesting statement. Paul is saying, look, his name is above all names. Every knee will bow. And by the way, even if you are living on earth and you're saying, I will never bow to God, or you put signs up and say, there is no God. Don't worry, you'll find out real soon. And, and you will stand before him and you will confess his name. Uh, <clears throat> understanding now that, knowing that truth, that his name is above all names, that every knee will bow down, uh, we should always be obedient to the Lord, to the doctrine of Christ. And we should always be working out our salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in us. Now, some have taken this scripture here in verse um, 12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling to mean you have to work for your salvation. That's what it sounds like. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What it's saying in the Greek, it's saying work out the things that accompany your salvation. And that is the process of sanctification. And so because you're saved, you're, you will be tr growing every day closer to God. You're going to be working out the things that he brings up in your life. And by the way, he does bring them up. He allows things to happen in your lives to show you your faith and where you lack, and then for you to work on it. But then it's him who works in you, right? Because the next statement is so important. And that's why you need to read the Bible in its context, read the scripture before and the scripture after, right? You gotta have 2020 vision when you're reading the Bible, right? Some Amen. have suggested that, 2020 vision. That means 20 verses before, 20 verses after, so that you get the context of yes. what it is saying there. And so in the context that we've been reading here, we know that the work has been done through Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.8 said it very clear. It's through grace, through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's nothing that we can do. Otherwise, we can boast. No, Paul's not saying here that work your salvation to eternal life. He's saying work out the things as you walk with the Lord, which is the things that accompany your salvation because it's God who works in us. And that's important. We need to allow God to work in us. How does that look? when God works in us. Well, when we're challenged uh, to do something, uh, we need to surrender ourselves to God, and whatever that is. Now, you might say, I have a hard time reading the Bible. Well, that's your flesh. That is your flesh saying, I don't wanna read the Bible. Now, your spirit is saying, but you should read the Bible. Now, you have a choice. Which one do you surrender to? And oftentimes, people surrender to the flesh. Well, I'm not gonna read it today. I'll read it tomorrow. Well, you made your choice. But if you surrender to the Lord 
and the Spirit, and you start reading, now you know it's God working in you. And you've surrendered to that because he wants you reading the Word of God. He wants you to understand it and he wants you to know it. And so we have to surrender to those challenges that come in our life every single day, guys. Every day. And it seems like every minute of the day we're challenged with these things. So, <clears throat> work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But it is the Lord who works it out for his good pleasure. For his good pleasure. <clears throat> now, verse 14 says, Do all things without murmuring and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Wow, how accurate is that? Because when we're serving, when we're trying to deny ourselves, when we're thinking of the interests of others, we have a tendency of murmuring. We do. I've shared that uh, experience that I had with the vacuum cleaner. You know, when the, we first started this church, I pretty much did, did everything. And I talked to a young, uh, oh, actually he wasn't young, but a, a gentleman at the pastor's conference, and he, he had just started a church, and he's about a year and he says, how do you get help? Because right now it's me and my wife doing everything. He says, welcome to the ministry. <laughs> welcome to the ministry. I could remember that when we first started. I was here vacuuming, cleaning the toilets, you know, shining the windows and all the brass and stuff. And there were times when I was doing that like, Lord, man, people just don't want to help. <laughs> you know, and I started complaining. And all of a sudden he would remind me, what are you complaining for while you're doing the work of the Lord? I'm like, I'm sorry, Lord. So I'd start singing songs. I'd start praising him. Um, we didn't have the sound system as we do today, so I just had to make them up in my head, you know? So I'd just make up things. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love what I'm doing. It's for your glory, you know? And I would just, and it would take my mind off of that sinful nature and put it on him. So there's, there's some good things about praising and worshiping and singing to the Lord. So, <clears throat> Do all things without murmuring and complaining and disputing because that seems to come along with our serving at times. And then we'll be blameless because we're light in a perverse generation. Boy, isn't our generation perverse? Yeah. Tony Clark just posted something. He says, I think we need to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah because yeah. we thought they were pretty bad. Yeah. And our, our world is getting pretty bad. And I think we're going to see it get worse and worse. Um, there's not a TV program. I don't watch a whole lot of sitcoms and, and shows, but I'm noticing now where if I do go to the movies and I even see a um, one of these superhero movies, you know, and I'll guarantee you watch, there's gonna be a superhero a homosexual of some sort, you know, you watch. But it seems like every movie now has a reference to, to the sexuality, you know, fornication, adultery, and all of those things. And it's just gonna get worse. I don't remember it being like that when I was a kid. You wouldn't, you know, leave it to Beaver, throw that out the door. There's, we're not even close to no. that. You know, everything is, is, is about sexuality and acceptance of that as, as a normal lifestyle. We're going to talk about that on Sunday as we go through Corinthians. We're going to go through one verse, but there's so much in that one verse that I had to just stop there and just expound on, wow. on it. <laughs> Um, but the Corinthians is a perfect example of our society today. It was a time of uh, sexual revolution, and they had different philosophies and thoughts on, on marriage and singleness and so forth. The Jews had their thoughts, the Greeks had their thoughts, and the Greeks were more liberal in it. Like, what's the big deal? You know, you have passions and you have desires. Just fulfill them. What's the problem? There shouldn't be an issue over it. And abortion was readily available then. You could discard your children. In fact, a, a, a person was not considered a child until their father accepted them as a child. Otherwise, you could just discard them. That was wow. their abortion at that time. So it was even worse. But we're getting there, right? We're getting there. Hillary says outside the womb, you could abort a child. That's what she's saying now. So you, you watch. It, it's it's going to get worse as we go on. But we're not to lose hope because God is still on the throne. And he's going to work a great work through through all of this. And we're going to be blown away by, by what he does and how he does it. And if you've ever seen the Lord work where your hands are not involved at all, it's an amazing thing to stand back and watch him work. I used to love when Chuck would say that. <clears throat> Someone would say, how did you do this, Chuck Hills? I have no idea. I just sit back. I ask for God's grace. 
and more grace, and I let him do all the work. <laughs> you know? And that's what we should be doing. Amen. So don't murmur, don't complain in this perverse generation. Verse 16 says, Holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, or labored in vain. And that really is the struggle, right? Hold on fast. Disneyland used to have a ride. I don't know if you remember it. It was a rocket ship. There in Tomorrow or Futureland. Yeah, Futureland. And it sat in the middle there, Futureland. You had that one ride where it was a round room and you'd sit in there and you'd see all the furniture and how the furniture has evolved and come to the future. But you remember the rocket one? And it was right in the middle, and you'd go up the elevator, you sat in the little seat, and it just spun around. And it'd go up higher, 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 like this. And I remember as a little kid, I got on that ride. And I guess I was too small. I felt like I was ready to fly out of that seat there, literally. I was like flying like this, and my legs were starting to come up, you know. And I'm thinking, I'm going to die, you know, <laughs> as a little kid. And so I grabbed on to whatever handles over there, and I was holding on to dear life itself, you know, because I was so scared. I don't think I ever got on that ride until I was an adult after that. But I held on with that thing with everything that I had. My hands probably hurt after I had done that. And that's what Paul is saying here. Hold fast the word of life. <laughs> Gotta hold fast. That means for dear life. Like it depends on it. And we have to hold on to the truth of God's word. So that what? We may rejoice in the day of Christ because we haven't run in vain or labored in vain. It's sad when you're <clears throat> laboring and laboring, but yet you're doing it in vain. In other words, you have no heart for it. It's worthlessness. It's not a mountain to anything. You have to do it with your whole heart when you serve the Lord. He goes on, yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Now, you can cross-reference that with verse 29 of chapter 1, right? For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. And then Paul says, yes, if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith. Mm -hmm. You see how he thought of others' interests than himself, right there. So evidence that Paul caught the teaching of Jesus Christ. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. And so he encourages them to do the same thing. So let's close up with these few verses. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. So here's Timothy, his protege. Uh, he's training him for ministry. He's been with Paul in various mission trips. And he's learning as he's going along the way and as Paul is writing. He's like-minded as Paul. And really what we need in the church are like-minded people. Um, what does that look like in the church and how does that function? It is so important that we are like-minded when we serve together in the church. If you're not like-minded, it's going to cause division. And there's really no reason for you to stay. You need to move on and find a church where you're like-minded with that church. You might have a, a, a philosophy or a way of doing things. Try to find a church that um, you can do that at. If not, then you need to learn to say, that's not about my philosophy. It's not about the way I do things. I need to let leadership be leadership. I need to let them do their thing. And I just need to be like-minded with them and come alongside and help them. You know, That's the place of a woman in a man's life, right? God made that very clear in Genesis that she's to come alongside and help him. She's a helpmate. That's what she was designed for. Not a throw rug, but a helpmate to come alongside and let him fulfill the calling that God has upon his life. And there are many women who understand that very clearly. And so here Paul is saying that we need to be like-minded, sincerely caring for your state. Um, he goes on in verse 20, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ. Now, for all seek their own. And that's so true, and that again, correlates with Ephesians, right? Where it says, no man ever hated his own flesh. 
And so here he puts it in a different way. For all seek their own, the things which are of Jesus Christ. Not the things which are Jesus Christ. But you know uh, his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. That is Timothy. Therefore, I hope to send him at once, as soon as I see how it works or how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall come or also come shortly. So, Paul is saying Timothy is like-minded, and I trust him. I know that he is not going to say something different than what I would say. And in a sense, he's a reflection of me. And so I'm sending him, and as he stands before you, it's as though I'm standing before you. I got a taste of this years ago when I went to a class at Costa Mesa while Chuck, was, Chuck Smith was still alive. And the teacher was teaching on the spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit. And before he even started, he made it very clear. I want you to know that Pastor Chuck can't be everywhere at once. And so what I'm going to teach here is exactly what Chuck believes about the Holy Spirit. You're only going to get what he says, what he's taught, what he's written about the Holy Spirit. You're not going to get my opinion. You're not going to get my two cents. You're just going to get that. And so he did that. He just took what Chuck believed. And I thought, wow. That impressed me more than the whole class. Because here's a man who I'm sure has opinions and thoughts, but he respected Chuck so much in the ministry and the leadership that he said, this is what you're going to get. I'm like-minded with, with Chuck. And today we don't get that. Now today you go into a church and say, well, I have this belief and this person might have a different belief, but we're trying to work together through those things. And there are some variances, you know, and you can agree to disagree agreeably, you know, in certain areas. But when it comes to the doctrinal things, you have to be like-minded. When it comes to the Bible and what the Bible says, you have to be like-minded in order for a ministry to grow. And I think that this ministry, one of the reasons that it's small, but God is using it in a powerful way right now. We might be small in the sense of numbers, but we're a part of the body of Christ, which is huge. But I think it's because men and women come in and they're not like-minded. They're refusing to be like-minded. They're refusing to surrender to the leadership and to its model of doing things, you know? And that becomes difficult, and so people don't normally stay. And the reason is, is because they think they know better. They think they know how to do it. And it's usually someone that's never done it before. Now, you don't know what it's like to be a pastor. I don't know what it's like to be you. I'm not going to even try to be you. You have your <laughs> unique problems, your unique correct character and all of that. So I have no idea what it's like to be you, and you don't have any idea what it's like to be me as a senior pastor or any senior pastor. And so we have to respect that of one another and work to be in unity. And that was Timothy, and Paul could trust him you know, with this letter to the Philippians. So good place to stop. Thank you for viewing Devo 30. Please share this on your Facebook wall. You never know who might be listening to it, or actually you can also do a a watch party uh, on it and see if some of your friends might want to watch and, and then join our Devo every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend. If you have no place of worship, why don't you join us here in this building as a church gathers together, as Hebrews 10.25 says very clearly we ought to do. We'd love to see you, meet you, get to know you. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.